obviously thrilled to be hosting this event again in person and excited to have folks here from Canada, from our neighbors in the States, uh, but also around the world, including the UK, Switzerland, Australia, Brazil, and Chile, among many other countries. And speakers presenting remotely as well from places like Uganda, Indonesia, Singapore, Germany, and many more. Um, this obviously reflects the growth of the international field of animal law. And we're pleased to be able to offer this emphasis on Canadian law, but informed by approaches in other countries, because I think we all agree that we're stronger when we work together and know what each other are up to. This conference is now in its fourth year and was founded in 2019 when Professor Jody Lazar and I collaborated to hold the first conference at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University in Halifax. We had planned to host a second one here in person in 2022, Angela. <laughs> and as you all know, uh, we were delayed in doing that for a couple of years, so we gathered online. Um, but there's nothing like uh, meeting in person. So. Yes, so tonight, tonight's keynote talk by Professor Martha Nussbaum is the kickoff for the Canadian Animal Law Conference. So today we were at the North American Animal Law Conference. This is with the Scholars Track. This is now the kickoff for the Canadian Animal Law Conference. Um, and I know that many of you enjoyed, a, uh, enjoy, en enjoyed joining us today um, for, for the North American one. This is a collaboration between the Canadian Animal Law Conference and the Brook in Brooks Institute for Animal Rights, Law and Policy. We are so very grateful for the leadership of the Brooks Institute and Tim Majur in particular for conceiving of um, spearheading the scholars track today and also for sponsoring the keynote uh, talk tonight. Uh, so our keynote speaker is Martha Nussbaum. Uh, she uh, really, um, oh, you want to, okay. Yeah, sorry, just a few more opening remarks before we get to Professor Nussbaum's talk. <laughs> sorry, not quite yet. Um, just to say the Brooks Institute is also the platinum sponsor for the overall conference, in addition to co-hosting the North American Animal Law Conference. That's a mouthful. And um, our gold sponsor for the Canadian conference is the Robert and Judith Clark Foundation for Animal Rights. Uh, we have some other sponsors just to say some quick thank yous to, including the Beagle Alliance, Arise Productions, Living Tree Foods, Val Koziol, and a special anonymous sponsor who helped ensure that some committed local animal advocates who are, are doing great work here in Toronto could also join. Uh, in our gift bags, you'll find items from Lush, Sweets from the Earth, Excitables, Herbaland, and also a water bottle from Brooks Institute. And important also to thank our stellar conference organizing committee. Uh, which was responsible for creating the amazing lineup that you'll all be enjoying tomorrow and on Sunday. So in addition to me and to Angela, this includes animal justice lawyers, Caitlin Mitchell and Scott Timmy, who I think are here, uh, Professor Manisha Decca of the University of Victoria, Professor Jessica Eisen of the University of Alberta, Professor Jody Lazar of uh, Schulich and Dalhousie, Professor Katie Sykes of Thompson Rivers, Professor Angela Lee of the Lincoln Alexander School at Toronto Metropolitan University, and Samantha Skinner, who's the student program lawyer with Animal Justice and helped with the conference organization. These folks waded through over 100 submissions uh, to help craft the exciting program that we're offering over the weekend. The Scholars Track Committee for the events today included the two of us, but also Jody Lazar, Katie Sykes, Tim Madura, Doug Kaiser, Justin Marceau, Janice Nadler, and Kristen Stilt. And a huge thank you also to Sarah Jansen, who's Animal Justice's events manager and makes sure everything runs smoothly at this conference. And many of our staff members at Animal Justice who also contributed to the University of Toronto staff, which has worked with us from day one, our film crew here today, and the many, many folks who volunteered to help us out during the event through moderating or speaking or other tasks. We thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Angela to introduce our <laughs> keynote speaker. <laughs> I'm so sorry to cut off those thank yous because they're so important and also, you know, involved about a thousand emails, <laughs> as those of you who've organized conferences know, so many emails, um, but that's great. Okay, so tonight we've got um, our, our keynote speaker, Professor Martha Nussbaum, who really needs no introduction. Um, she has written so many books and articles, um, a wonderful pathbreaking work, and if you'd like to see more um, about her and the bio, I would direct you to the conference website, because if I start listing them all, we'll just be here, I'll just be standing here talking the whole time and you will get to hear from her. <laughs> So please, Professor Nussbaum, a big welcome oh, to you. Thank you. I, mean, I, I want to say what a great honor it is to be invited to speak to all of you because I have so much respect for the very, very valuable work that so many of so you are doing. So uh, I'm going to talk about the central themes of my new book, which will come out at the end of the year. 
But of course, I can't present very much of the argument, and I hope in the q and A I I can say a lot more about things that are in the book. The book is called Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility, and this talk is called Justice for Animals, Practical Progress Through Phys Philosophical Theory. Animals suffer injustice at our hands. The cruelties of the factory farming industry, poaching and trophy hunting, assaults on the habitats of so many creatures, and innumerable other instances of cruelty and neglect. Human domination is everywhere. In the seas, where marine mammals die from ingesting plastics, in the skies, where migratory birds die in large numbers from air pollution and collisions with buildings, and obviously on the land, where the habitats of so many large mammals have been destroyed almost beyond repair. Addressing these large problems requires dedicated work and effort, but I think it also requires a good normative theory to direct our efforts. I'll argue that an approach based on my version of the capabilities approach is the one we need, and I'll try to show briefly how it directs our efforts better than rival approaches. So section one, justice as thwarted striving. So what is injustice? Here are a few stories that will yield an intuitive account. My examples will, as you all know, be only the smallest sample of what can befall an animal and only a small sample of animal kinds, but I'll pair two descriptions, one of the animal going about its own life, flourishing, and another of the animal brought to grief by wrongful human treatment. Because non-human animals are so often treated as mere things, not individual sentient beings, and because one aspect of that thing-like treatment has been the refusal of a proper name, scientists today insist on giving proper names to the individual animals they study. I'll follow this practice here, taking names from both fact and fiction. Let me then introduce you to three particular animals. Virginia is a sensitive female elephant in Kenya, described and named by elephant scientist Joyce Boy. Cole in her in memoir, coming of age with elephants. Hal Whitehead is a great whale scientist, especially focused on whale song. So I've given his name to a humpback whale who is proficient at singing, one of a group I observed from a whale watching boat near the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. No fictional pig is more imperious and more striking than the Empress of Blandings in the novels of P.G. Woodhouse, a noble black Berkshire sow in superb condition and much love, who has won many medals. So first, the mother elephant, Virginia's story. Virginia has large amber eyes. When she hears music she likes, she stands very still and her eyes droop. Joyce Poole spends her days with the whole matriarchal group and finds that Virginia, smaller than the lead matriarch, Victoria, has a particular fondness for Joyce's singing. Amazing Grace is her particular favorite. Often, however, Virginia is on the move, covering huge tracts of grassland, her feet padding noiselessly across the floor of Kenya's Amboseli National Park. Her new baby elephant walks beneath her belly, sheltered by that enormous maternal frame. Elephants are wonderful mothers, highly protective of their young, and even known to sacrifice their lives to save young elephants from danger. Now, consider something that might happen that often does happen. Virginia lies on her side, dead, her tusks and trunk hacked off by a machete, her face a bloody red hole. The ivory trade flourishes despite many attempts to curb it, and the market for animal trophies, such as tails and trunks, flourishes with few impediments. It's not even illegal to import such trophies into the United States. The other females gather around her and try vainly to lift her body with their trunks. Eventually, giving up the effort, they sprinkle earth and grass upon her body. The baby elephant is missing, taken very likely to sell to some commercial zoo, often in the U.S., that's not too particular about origins. Second, the humpback whale, Hal's story. Our small whale watching boat cuts through the choppy surf off of Australia's Great Barrier Reef. 
In the distance, several pods of humpback quails appear, breaching and slapping their tails and flukes. Their huge backs gleam in the sun. One of them is Hal. Over the boat's motor, we hear the whales singing, the patterns of sound too complex for our ears to chart them, although we know that humpback quail's song has a complicated syntactic structure, an enormous variety, and is constantly changing, sometimes, apparently, out of sheer fashion and interest in novelty. A variant that originates here may make its way to Hawaii in a year's time as whales imitate one another. The sound is beautiful to us and deeply mysterious. Now, look at a different possible how. Washed up, dead on a beach in the Philippines. His once healthy frame is emaciated and inside, and inside researchers find, find 88 pounds of plastic trash, including bags, cups, and other single use items. Another whale similarly choked on plastic was found to contain within the refuse a pair of flip-flops. Hal has starved to death. Plastic gives whales the sensation of fullness, but no nutrition. Eventually, there's no room for real food to enter. Some of the plastic in Hal's stomach had been there so long that it had calcified, turned into a plastic brick. He will not sing again. And third, the Sow, the story of Empress of Blandings. Empress of Blandings is a noble black barkshire sow of enormous size, cared for as a favorite companion on the estate of Blandings Castle. She loves her trough, where appetizing food is always offered her by her human caretaker, whose name is Cyril Wellbeloved. When Wellbeloved had to go to jail for a short term, time for drunken and disorderly conduct, however, the empress begins to pine and loses her appetite. Her human family, especially the very pig-focused Lord Emsworth, worries helplessly about her well-being, tempting her with various treats, but in vain. By a stroke of good fortune, however, Jamie Belford turns up at Blandings, and his skill in hog calling, learned during a period of work on a farm in Nebraska, brings the empress back to her usual good spirits. She eats with gusto making, quote, a sort of gulpy, gurgly, plobby, squishy, wafflesome sound that delights Lord Emsworth. Shortly thereafter, she takes her first civil, silver medal at the 87th Shropshire Agricultural Show in the Fat Pigs class. Now, imagine a different life for the Empress. Instead of flourishing among the kindly people and the fostering surroundings of Blandings Castle, and the gentle world of P.G. Woodhouse, where all beings are treated with love and humor. The Empress has had the bad fate to be living on a hog farm in Iowa in the early 21st century. Now newly pregnant, she has been thrust into a gestation crate, a narrow metal enclosure the size of her body with no bedding, floored with slats of concrete or metal to allow waste to descend into sewage lagoons below. She cannot walk or turn around, and she cannot even lie down. No kindly hog caller speaks to her. No pig-loving humans admire and love her. No other pigs or other farm animals greet her. She's just a thing, a breeding machine. Most of the approximately six million sows in the United States are on such factory farms, and these crates are used in most states though banned in nine states and in several foreign countries. Sows in gestation crates show loss of muscle and bone mass from lack of exercise. They exhibit behaviors such as bar biting and tongue rolling indicative of boredom and frustration. And one what is frustrating, frustrating being forced to defecate where they live because sows are really very clean animals and they normally choose to defecate very far from where they sleep and eat. Another is deprivation of all society, for pigs are highly intelligent and social animals. Though the use of crates is given a spurious justification on the alleged grounds that sows not so confined will fight with one another, this specious argument simply assumes that sows could not possibly be given enough space to go and come and move as they choose. 
in a poignant allusion to the fact that pigs are not mere automata, but have a characteristic form of life, the Pew Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production recommended in 2008, quote, the phase out within 10 years of all intensive confinement systems that restrict nat natural movement and normal behaviors, including swine gestation crates. Well, as you see, many years later, it has not happened. These stories summon us to both compassion and what I've elsewhere called transition anger. That is an anger that is not backward looking and retributive, but forward looking and corrective. We feel this is outrageous, it should not happen going forward. But why do we react this way? What do the three stories have in common? First, in all three cases, we're aware that we're dealing with a sentient being, a creature who feels pain, who perceives, who has its own perspective on the world. Second, the creature is trying to live and to live a life characteristic of an animal of that kind. That's what the good stories bring out, describing a flourishing life for each animal. Third, the animal's striving for flourishing has been thwarted, and it has been thwarted by conduct that is either deliberate or negligent. These are, for me, the basic intuitive ingredients of injustice, the wrongful thwarting of a sentient being's striving. Section two, three flawed approaches. And I should say in the book, there's a whole chapter on each of these. So I think it's a very brief critique. And I apologize for that. Let us now examine three prominent philosophical approaches that have been direct and practical and legal efforts to combat injustice toward animals. <clears throat> I confine myself to Western philosophy and I don't even delve back far into its history where late Platonism in the works of Porphyry and Plutarch make striking contributions to thinking about animal rights. As for non-Western thought, I note that Indian Buddhist and Hindu philosophy has rich resources for defending the rights of animals. And an Indian court declared in 2014 that animals are persons under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which makes it illegal to deprive a person of life or liberty without due process of law. The first flawed approach is one that I call the so like us approach. It's based on the traditional idea of a scala naturae, a ladder of nature, with, with humans securely at the top. Users of this approach, in particular legal thinker Steve Wise and his non-human rights project, argue that a group of creatures who seem to them to be very like humans in intelligence, especially great apes, but more recently Wise has included whales and elephants, should count as persons in law and should receive various protections on the ground of their likeness to humans. It was used recently in the US unsuccessfully to argue for the transfer of a group of apes to an animal sanctuary from an experimental facility, and later, more recently, for the transfer of an elephant from the Bronx Zoo to a sanctuary. <clears throat> there are many flaws in this approach. First, it offers nothing for the sufferings of so many creatures who are deemed not sufficiently like us. Indeed, by offering similarity to humans as the decisive reason for good treatment, it positively discourages attention to the predicament, predicaments of other animals. Second, it is flawed empirically and lacking in curiosity, not willing to investigate the manifold forms that intelligence and cognitive complexity take in the animal world. <clears throat> intelligence and cognitive complexity are manifold, and creatures from the octopus to marine creatures of many types to birds, amazingly versatile and long underestimated, have many different types of intelligence, some of which we humans do not possess. Birds can navigate over huge distances by sensing magnetic fields, a sensory apparatus we lack. Dolphins can determine what is inside an object they approach by their sensory capacity for echolocation, that is perceiving by the reverberation that comes back to them from the object. A surprising instance, a captive dolphin became aware of her tra trainer's pregnancy before the trainer herself was even aware of it, and the dolphin signaled it to her. So nature does not present a ladder. It presents indeed amazing horizontal variety, 
each creature having the capacity suited to its environmental niche and form of life. Third, the approach values animals for the wrong reasons, because of us, not because of them. It's narcissistic and complacent, first assuming our first place value and then conceding that some few other creatures manage to attain value by likeness. But each animal's goals are its own and its life is its own. And I, I should add here that I really do honor Steve Wise's practical work and we make common cause on many practical cases. Second is the utilitarian approach, which began with Jeremy Bentham's clarion call to concern in a famous footnote in his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, 1789. Bentham's overall view holds that the only good thing is pleasure and the only bad thing is pain. In the footnote, he insists that animals are just as vulnerable to pain and suffering as humans are, and he predicts that the day will come when our harsh domination over animals will seem just as heinous as the slave trade now does to right-thinking people, or so he says, somewhat exaggerating the degree to which British <laughs> thought had progressed by that time and totally ignoring atrocities in America. Just as the color of a person's skin should not be a reason for differentially bad treatment, says Bentham, so too the, quote, velocity, that's the hairiness of the skin, and the curvature of the os sacrum should not be reasons for our brutal oppression of animals. Bentham followed this up with other writings, denouncing hunting and fishing for sport, although he still did think it was permissible to kill animals for food if done in a painless manner. Bentham's great student, John Stuart Mill, followed his lead, both writing about the rights of animals and leaving all his money to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Today, utilitarian philosopher Peter Singer, their distinguished philosophical heir, has been a leader in calling for the abolition of cruel practices to animals. This approach is a lot better, and it does zero in on a key issue in our exploitation of animals, namely pain. But it flattens the world too much. Animals do need freedom from pain, but they also need the ability to move freely, to play, to choose their own paths through the world, to enjoy social relationships. Furthermore, sometimes animals who have never been exposed to these good things do not even feel pain when they're without them. They form what economists call adaptive preferences. So as in the human case, the utilitarian criterion can be an ally of an unjust status quo. Another problem is that the utilitarian goal is a state, pleasure, or in Singer's version, preference satisfaction. So the value of agency is neglected. People don't just want to end up in a state of satisfaction. They want to strive and to attain what they attain by their own efforts. And this is, I think, true of animals just as much as of human beings. Finally, what utilitarianism recommends is not individual focused enough. The goal is either the greatest total pleasure or the greatest average pleasure, depending on what version we use. So complicated empirical calculations are required in order to balance our, our pleasure meat eating against the pain of the killed animals. And there's no guarantee at all that the animal protective result will actually win. The condition of those at the bottom of society's ladder, in short, does not have any intrinsic importance, a notorious problem for utilitarianism generally. Third is the Kantian approach of Christine Korsgaard's wonderful recent book, Fellow Creatures. This approach does better still, developing an attractive account of what it is to treat an animal as an end rather than a means. And in many important respects, its practical recommendations dovetail with my own. Korsgaard diverges from Kant, who held that animals are just property that we may use as we please, and she develops a promising approach from both Kantian and Aristotelian materials. But Korsgaard clings too much to Kant to satisfy me. She insists that humans are the only creatures capable of normative thinking and self-direction. And that for this reason, though that doesn't make humans better, it does mean that the other creatures can only be what she calls passive citizens, 
not active participants in indicating what justice is for them. I think we should criticize this argument both empirically and normatively. Human ethical capacities are part of our animal heritage and we share them to a greater or lesser degree with many animals. Moreover, it doesn't make normative sense to me to conclude that a creature not capable of ethical thought of this exalted sort cannot be an active citizen. Creatures of many kinds, including human children and people with disabilities, lack the Kantian moral abilities, and yet we do consider them active citizens, allowing their preferences to be heard when laws are made, even though in many circumstances they will have to be represented by a surrogate. So why not say the same about animals? Section three, the capabilities approach, striving and forms of life. So let's turn now to my own capabilities approach. As an approach to justice in the human world, it holds that a minimally just society will provide each and every citizen with a threshold level of 10 significant capabilities. Capabilities are substantive opportunities for choice, not just inner abilities or abstract possibilities. As an approach to justice for non-human animals, my approach holds that all sentient creatures, that is all who have an internal subjectivity, a point of view on the world, a category that includes all vertebrates and many invertebrates, ought to have the opportunity to live a flourishing life in accordance with the characteristic life form of their own species. So let me now elaborate. Subsection A, a virtual constitution. In the human case, the CA, which I'll use as the abbreviation, supplies a template for constitution making. The list has both content and a tentative threshold for each item. A nation aiming at minimal justice can look to it and frame its own list with more locally specific accounts of each of the major capabilities on the list. For two reasons, this approach to the other animals is not possible at present. First, the other animals often roam across national borders or occupy regions of air and sea that are not the property of a single nation. So a national constitution is not sufficient to protect these migratory species. Second, there's not anything like sufficient political will in most of the nations of the world to enact a constitution anytime soon. Right now, therefore, the CA aims to supply a virtual constitution to which nations, states, and regions may look in trying to improve or newly frame their animal protective laws. It is my hope that over time, this virtual constitution can increasingly become the object of a Rawlsian political overlapping consensus, both within each nation and across national boundaries. This will take time and a lot of work, but so too does the task of framing and protecting human rights. Still, this flexible approach permits nations to stride boldly ahead without waiting to get a global consensus. The basic goal is that all animals would have the opportunity to live lives compatible with their dignity and their striving up to a reasonable threshold level of protection and with exceptions for self-defense and defense of others. Subsection B, lists and lives. Ideally, we should learn enough to make a separate list for each type of creature, putting on the list the things that matter most when it comes to survival and flourishing. In effect, the list is really made by the animals themselves as they express their deepest concerns as they try to live. The people who can be trusted to record the unheard voices of animals are people who have lived with a given type of animal for years with love and sensitivity. Ideally, there should be a group of such people for each species because any individual is fallible. These guardians and listeners should also know individual animals within the species in all their variety and know the obstacles each creature faces and what interventions prove helpful. Now, this means a huge number of different lists. However, I believe that if we focus on the large general rubrics of the CA list for humans, as it exists now, it offers good guidance as a starting point in virtually all cases. Now, Camille, if you can, this is the time to put on the screen the capabilities list. Well, 
that right up here. Okay. So that should come as no surprise. Okay, everyone can see that. Um, since the CA list captures in effect the shared terrain of vulnerable striving animality that each species, including the human species, inhabits in its own way. All strive for life, for health, for bodily integrity, for the opportunity to use whatever senses, imagination, and thought are characteristic for that kind of creature. Practical reason sounds at first too human to be a good guide, but really it isn't. All creatures want the opportunity to make some key choices about how their lives will go, to be the makers of plans and decisions. Affiliation is crucial for all animals, though its types vary. Yeah. And, and next, next seek seeks to relate well to the world of nature around them. And this usually includes members of their own species, but also of other species. Play and fun are not peculiar to humans, as researchers increasingly understand, but key aspects of animal sociability. And all animals finally seek types of control over their material and social environment. If there are other large rubrics pertinent to animal lives that the human list omits, I can't think of them now, but would be totally open to expanding the large rubrics of the list if any should be convincingly brought forward. So now you can take the list down. People might worry that such a list is bound to be anthropomorphic, verging on some of the errors of the so like us approach. I understand this worry. I think it's mistaken. The list was made up not by thinking of what is distinctively human, but by thinking in very general terms about vulnerable and striving animality, a topic that Aristotle already addressed in the little work on which I wrote my long ago doctoral dissertation on the motion of animals back in, I hate to tell you, 1975. In that work, he proposed what he called a common explanation for why and how animals move through the world to get the things they need and desire, allowing for significant variations at the species level, but insisting that at a general level, we can find a common pattern. I think so too, that we must always be on our guard against obtuseness and self-privileging perception. Sometimes the common explanation will include items within the finer, the lowercase rubrics of the human list that appear at first blush not to matter to the lives of animals. Consider freedom of association and freedom of speech. Well, what are most zoos but means of denying animals freedom of association? As for speech, animals express what they need and want in their own ways, often highly sophisticated, often possessing even syntactic complexity. And under formal US law, freedom of speech pertains to many forms of expressive activity, not just words on paper, but symbolic activities of many different kinds, such as flag, flag burning, for example. So why then should this legal category not be thought to include the ways in which animals speak it certainly could if only animals had legal standing in the first place. It's not that they don't speak, it's that we humans usually don't listen. Animals are not free to speak, however, when their complaints are ignored, when information about conditions in the factory farming industry are systematically screened from public view, when even human allies of the afflicted pigs and chickens are prevented by so-called ag-gag laws, laws restricting reporting from describing those conditions. Freedom of speech is hugely pertinent to animals, and it's important for exactly the reasons that John Stuart Mill gave when he defended free speech in On Liberty. Free speech gives information we need to make our society better. It challenges complacency and smugness. It brings forward unfashionable positions that deserve and indeed require a hearing. Some minor rubrics of the human list matter for animals in a slightly different way, a less more indirect way. Some of the specific subcategories might strike us as inappropriate to animals. For example, freedom of the press or political participation. However, let's pause and think again. Animals do not write newspaper articles, but the free circulation of information about their predicament 
is a crucial part of their good in this world where humans dominate all animal lives. Just as the great famine in China was not known even to Mao for a long time because of the absence of a free press, so too restrictions such as ag-gag laws prevent information about animal suffering from getting out into the public domain where action can be taken. To be sure, the articles and books will have to be written by humans and the videos will have to be photographed by humans, but they matter for and in the lives of the animals whose voices of complaint they record and whose intolerable conditions they display. Much of the same thing is true of political participation. Most animals, though often political enough within their own species group, have little interest in political participation in the human world and are unaware of elections, assemblies, and offices. Nonetheless, what happens there matters hugely for them. In the human-dominated world, politics determines the rights and privileges of all denizens of a given place and makes crucial decisions about matters of welfare, habitat, and so forth. So it matters that animals have a political say, which means, I believe, legal standing and legal representation. Right now, we allow surrogate representation for humans with cognitive disabilities, so the proposal involves nothing terribly surprising. And in fact, just recently, as you may certainly know, the hippos in Colombia who were about to be culled were the plaintiffs in a legal action. And of course, that action was taken through human lawyers, but the hippopotamuses were named as the plaintiffs because Colombia allows hip, uh, animals standing. Creatures who live in a place should have a say in how they live. At the level of the finer concrete rubrics of the list, there will then be surprising instances of overlap. At this level, however, there will also be much divergence, and we should always be open to surprise and learning. Each kind of animal has its own form of social organization and even of sense perception. Some animals, as I've said, have senses we lack, and usually the senses we do have are realized differently in animal lives. Only painstaking and loving study will show what we should shoot for. Subsection C, fertile functionings, corrosive disadvantages. These are terms coined by Jonathan Wolfe and Abner de Chalit in their wonderful book, Disadvantage. Because the approach I envisage is specific to each type of animal life, its demands are many and heterogeneous, but within each case, and even across many cases, there are likely to be capabilities that are particularly fertile, promoting good lives across the board, and capability failures that are especially corrosive and damaging. For all well, animals, objection to arbitrary are human violence is a corrosive disadvantage, whether it takes the form of whales' vulnerability to harpooning, elephants' vulnerability to poaching, female pigs' confinement through gestation crates, or a dog's vulnerability to a so-called owner's cruelty and neglect. Another corrosive disadvantage across the board is environmental pollution and degradation, which cause lethal conditions, whether of air or land or water, for many species and ruins their habitats. So the opposite of these ills, bans on cruel practices, and a dedication to environmental cleanup will prove fertile, enhancing capabilities across the board for many species. Subsection D, species members are individuals. So far, I spoke of a list for each type of animal, but for animals as for humans, each individual creature should be treated as an end. And animals are individuals, not just numerically, that is each and every one matters, but also qualitatively, each species member is subtly different from every other. People who live with companion animals know that the personalities and preferences of their companions are highly individual, and that what is good for one dog or one cat is not necessarily good for another. But we usually fail to notice this variety in the case of animals with whom we don't live. However, scientists who do live with a given type of animal recognize and emphasize these differences. Each baboon, each elephant is a member of baboon or elephant society, and that's very important. But each individual has a unique way of inhabiting that world. 
so too with every type of animal that we've been able to study carefully. But if each individual is both separate from others, having its own life to live, not anyone else's, and qualitatively different in some ways from others, isn't it a mistake to frame the lists as centering around a species form of life? Isn't that to deny each animal's uniqueness? Isn't it obtuse or even objectifying to speak of the dolphin or the dolphin form of life, rather than to create a separate story and a separate list for each individual dolphin? For example, for fungi, the beloved dolphin in Dingo Bay, Ireland, whose disappearance in October 2020 has caused wide, widespread distress. The inhabitants of Dingle Bay came to know fungi over the decades as a dolphin with a unique personality, quirky, oddly solitary for a dolphin, atypically social toward humans. Why wouldn't fungi's uniqueness be obliterated by an approach based on the species? All law is general, but good laws are based on a knowledge of many particulars and can be revised when new particulars come to light. Moreover, the list is a list of capabilities, not mandatory functions. The opportunities it creates can be used by different creatures in different ways, or not used at all if the animal doesn't want to use them. Capabilities are entitlements, a type of rights. People typically do not think that human rights reduce all humans to a cookie cutter model. They're spaces within which varied individuals are free to choose. I think it's the same story with each type of animal. We study communities belonging to a given species, and of course, species is a rough term for what is common to various populations. It's not a metaphysical entity. Then we frame a list, and then the qualitatively different species members can use those entitlements each in their own ways, just so long as we protect those spaces. Fungi is different from every other dolphin, but the capabilities that protect dolphins in general will also protect him and be used by him in his unique way. He doesn't have to socialize with a large pod if he doesn't want to. He's perfectly free to hang around the coast. And if one day he does decide to go off in search of a larger pod, he's protected in that choice too. That's one speculation about what actually happened to him. Although given his relatively advanced age, death is unfortunately another possibility. That's how the approach respects individual creatures by creating protected spaces for them to seek flourishing each in their own way. Through future judicial specification, the list will get refined. And if people who live with and care about that type of animal were to protest that the list is incomplete or mistaken, then, then it ought to be changed. One more point, part of the goal will often include interspecies relationships. There are, of course, some animals whose lives are pretty much wrapped up in the life of their kind. Dolphins and elephants do not usually rely on robust relationships with other species as crucial elements in their flourishing. Although that's not to say that a friendship across the species barrier might not arise under suitable conditions. But there are other animals whose form of life is far more relational across the species barrier. Dogs, cats, many horses, and farm animals who are not being tortured. These animals cultivate relationships with one another, and they all seem to seek and need relationships with humans. So this simply gets built into the list that we would make for each type of creature as a protected desideratum. Reliance on a species norm does not imprison a creature within its own species. Section four, practical implications, some examples. In a way, the practical applications distinctive to this approach are obvious, show respect for all forms of life, not just those that seem like us. Don't just focus on pain, but look at the whole form of life. Many zoos don't actually inflict pain, but they do support in many cases, the animal's characteristic form of life, especially social life. And don't treat animals as passive recipients of a handout, but allow their intelligent strivings and expressions of preference to determine the shape of legal action. To return to my three stories, my approach would mean strenuous efforts worldwide to stop poaching and the abduction of young animals, 
It would mean an end to the whole factory farm industry in the short term and in the long term, an end to our reliance on killing animals for meat in favor perhaps of artificial meat or perhaps so-called real meat grown from stem cells without killing animals. In Hal's case, it would mean a concerted effort on the part of all humanity to reform our heedless behavior with regard to plastic trash <laughs> and aggressive cleanups to remove the plastic that's already there. I end this lecture with just, just one detailed example of legal implementation of the spirit of my approach. A happy harbinger of what may be a new era in law <coughs> in the form of a remarkable 2016 opinion by the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in a case known as Natural Resources Defense Council Incorporated versus Pritzker. I, I should say that's Penny Pritzker, not my governor Pritzker, uh, who's seeking reelection, but it's his sister. She was Secretary of Commerce under President Obama. The US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled that the US Navy violated the law in seeking to continue a sonar program that impacted the behavior of whales. To some extent, this opinion is a technical exercise in statutory interpretation of a law called the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The court says that the fact that a program has negligible impact on marine mammals does not exempt it from a separate statutory requirement, namely that it establish means of, quote, affecting the least practicable adverse impact on, unquote, marine mammal species. What is significant and fascinating is that the argument relies heavily, without, I'm sure, without knowing my work or any capabilities work, but relies heavily on a consideration of whale capabilities that the program disrupts, and I'll quote, effects from exposures below 180 decibels can cause short-term disruption of or abandonment of natural behavior patterns. These behavioral disruptions can cause affected marine mammals to stop communicating with each other, to flee or avoid an insonified area, to cease foraging for food, to separate from their calves, and to interrupt mating. LFA sonar can also cause heightened stress responses from marine mammals. That's the emotional health on the list. Such behavioral disruptions can force marine mammals to make trade-offs like delaying migration, delaying reproduction, reducing growth, or migrating with reduced energy reserves. That's the end of the quote. Oh, the opinion does not have whales standing. No such radical legal move was necessary to reach the clear result that the program is unacceptable under the statute. Because the whales did not have statute, have standing, they had to depend on the luck of having protection through the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a law made by human legislators, but with some concern for the behavior and interest of whales. The whales also had to depend on judges who read the law imaginatively, as prior judges had not done, actually, taking very seriously a set of obstructions to the whales' form of life that did not involve the infliction of pain. The opinion written for a unanimous three-judge panel by Judge Ronald Gould, who sits in and has long lived in the state of Washington, where whale watching is a common pastime, concluded that obstructing a characteristic form of life activity, even without pain, is a so-called adverse impact. I imagine this judge, I don't know him, as someone who has really looked at whales with curiosity and wonder. But whether he or his clerks have really gone out whale watching, the opinion displays ethical and imaginative attunement of a type increasingly seen in coastal areas of the United States, perhaps in the Seattle area above all. It sees whales as complex beings with an active form of life that includes emotional well being, affiliation, free movement, in short, a variety of species specific forms of agency. The opinion goes well beyond Bentham, and it also steers clear of the so like us approach. Nor, like the Kantian, does it view whales as merely passive citizens. It is a harbinger, it is to be hoped, of a new era in the law of animal welfare and animal justice. 
So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. So much for Professor Nussbaum. So I'm just going to go over and turn the microphone on. And as you'll see, uh, Professor Nussbaum, unfortunately, you won't be able to see our questioners, but they can see you and you oh. will be able to hear them. <laughs> well, say your name at least and where you're from. I mean, like what university or what place you're from. That would be very helpful. So uh, we'll just ask anyone who has a question to come over to the mic. I'm just going to go turn that on. Professor Nasuam. Yes. Hi, I'm I'm, I'm Sean Kalpa Ghosh. Uh, I'm an engineer and an artist, and I uh, really appreciate your leading with uh, advancing these ideas. Um, I have just a, a, a question with two subsections, to use your language. Um, basically, oh, I, I have a question with just two two parts that I hope you can answer in one way. Okay. One is you present these as competing philosophical theories uh, that would obviously have very different pragmatic results. Um, do you think one could ever arrive at uh, synthesis, you know, kind of like Derek Parfit's triple theory effort? Um, or is it too early to even consider that? And then uh, second, you know, in a practical sense, um, would there be like an ideal deployment or jurisdiction or kind of test of your virtual constitution if someone actually said, let's make it actual? Um, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the synthesis, uh, actually, I do take this up in the book because I think it's very important since I am a Rawlsian political liberal to think in terms of an overlapping consensus. So we want to show that the approach over time could garner uh, an overlapping consensus of other reasonable approaches. And I, I do believe that in, in many respects, it can certainly course guards in mind. There's basically little practical difference because I think the thing is that all the people who have all these approaches are very uh, love animals and they look at them and they, they really have the right practical instinct, but it's really the theory that's problematic. And I think Korsgaard and I can agree across the great terrain. And we only might differ about whether we consider animals citizens as I do, or just passive as, sh as she does. But, but in most practical respects, we agree. Steve Weiss and I, you know, I mean, I've talked to him a lot, and I think he just thinks you can make more progress right now, given the way most Americans think with his approach. Uh, I don't know about that. I think that we should probably forge ahead with the best approach and with the truth, and you know, not just try to say something that's false and anthropocentric because judges might believe it. Um, so anyway, we differ in that way. But I think he really cares about all the animals too. He he doesn't. It's it, you know when I say it doesn't give anything to the other animals, he he fully knows that, and he wants to help all animals. He calls it like the thin end of a wedge. So yes, I mean we can agree on a lot of things. Utilitarians, you know, they're more dogmatic. I think <laughs> uh, I think they really do think the pain is the only thing that matters. But they have various ways of saying, well, if an animal doesn't have society, it feels pain, and so. But that you know, as with the human case. Adaptive preferences are a real problem for them. So I, I really think, theoretically, they're the most resistant. But in the end of the day, of course, Peter Singer is a great activist, and he wants to make common cause with other approaches. In fact, he has said that in animal liberation, he didn't use a utilitarian approach at all because he wanted the wide, widest possible consensus. So, so yeah, and I think we should seek that. But I do think that given that we're dealing with vast public that is pretty ill-schooled in any possible approach, it would be good to start them off with one that steers them in the right direction. So that's that's what I'm trying to say. Um, is there a test? Well, you know, I do feel that bit by bit, we're getting that. Now, if you, if you think about the laws that have emerged about companion animals, and I think I pay great, great homage in the book to Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka and their wonderful work on this, I think, you know, we, we are reaching a, a consensus about what a virtual constitution for dogs and cats might look like. Uh, with other species, you know, we just have to work and, and get there. Unfortunately, 
the creatures that, that do worst are the ones that we can't interact with easily. So whales are still being harpooned, you know? They wriggle out of the international, I mean, Japan just quit the International Whaling Commission because they didn't feel like being told they couldn't harpoon whales. So this is really difficult. And we're just going to have to keep writing about this. I'm just working on another new piece about books about whaling. And even the people who love whales and know something about them still think, oh, well, now we'll use them as we please. It, it's quite strange that people can, you know, it's, it's like all forms of evil, I guess. People are good at compartmentalizing. So I think that maybe as the test, we could look at what's happened to protections that we now have for dogs and cats, which are not good enough. I think at all, but at least they're going in the right direction. And we could think, well, what would it be like if we, we did something like that and did it better for all the other species? Thank you for that. Um, I think we've got another question heading up to the mic. Hi, Professor Nussbaum, it's Angela Fernandez from the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. So I just wanted to say, I really like this idea of assuming and starting with the same list that you would use for humans. And so when, you know, Camille put it up for you there and I thought, oh, the practical reason why being able to plan conception of the good and so on. I mean, you can, you can imagine someone, you know, kind of like bristling a bit and taking issue with that but you know part and I did actually bristle a little bit and uh, but you know then I thought yeah but there's a very important I think symbolism there and move in terms of like saying well will we start out with that supposition that it would be the same and then maybe move from there so um, that's just to say I that really resonated with me and I, I, I really like that I wanted to ask you you know the three examples that you started with um, Virginia the elephant Hal the whale, and then the sow. I, it was interesting because when you started to explain the singing aspect, both for Virginia and for Sal, I thought, oh, we're, you know, you were going to say something about flourishing and singing, and so I was sort of waiting for that in the context of the sow, and then it didn't come, and the sow example is about gestation and the utter immobilization. And so I just was wondering, you know, the, the standard of flourishing and the concept of flourishing, while well, we would want that for all non-human animals, it seems to me like there's a huge difference between the Virginia and Hal situation and then the South situation. And what do you think about, you know, in in the in the gestation crate situation, you know, just I, I guess maybe acknowledging to some extent that flourishing is so far away from what that situation is, and is there some kind of in between? You know, um, does does that make sense? I think, uh, first of all, I, this is only, I only had time for three cases. So, so the motif of singing, I actually talk about birds in some of the other cases. So the theme of singing go, goes straight through and the bird being choked by air pollution and not able to sing. But, um, you know, I think <clears throat> they are different in the sense that, first of all, the life of Virginia was going along quite nicely if these criminals, had, had been stopped. And, and so it's like somebody being murdered on the streets of Chicago. I mean, she was murdered. And so that's a disruption of life that we can at least envisage because we know in criminal law what it would be like to stop murderers from murdering people. We, we at least know what it is to stop that. Uh, in the case of the sow, you know, again, of course, in previous times, in Woodhouse was not just making up a fiction. Pigs were often treated with great love and generosity, even though, of course, some of them were going to be slaughtered, not, not Empress of Landings. She was just reared for her winning nettles at the show. But, you know, no pigs were tortured in the 18th century the way pigs are tortured today. So I think we, we know what it would be. I mean, there are two stages, I guess. First stage is to stop torturing them and try to, you know, have humane slaughter. But of course, what I'm shooting for is the total end of the factory farm industry. And that would mean that there will be fewer pigs in the world, of course. But that's, uh, to me, you know, the numbers don't really count because I'm not a total utilitarian. But I, I really don't think there's any way of reforming hog breeding that would stop short of 
the wholesale abolition of the factory farming industry. And that's true for chickens, for pigs, and for cattle. But at least we, I mean, I'm, I tend to be a liberal revisionist. So that I, I'm willing to stop the worst abuses first and then move on. So if we just stop the crates, as nine states have already done, that's some progress. At least they, their lives, which are unjustly being ended, would not be so painful. So yeah, I, mean, I, I think we have to think which abuses are the worst and, and start with those. But the whale, let, let me say something about how. The whale was living a wonderful life. And at least in this case that I describe, no one was trying to interfere with his life. Now, of course, the plastic trash is just one obstacle that such a whale will face. Another, of course, is harpooning. Another is, unfortunately, sonic disruptions outside of the statutory reach of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. That is, you know, we can police coastal waters, but out there, what do we have? We have oil companies trying to find undersea oil that are creating sonic disturbances that are horrendous and totally disruptive to the lives of whales. Okay. That's, That's much, much harder to stop than sonar, of course, because sonar is something that a nation does in its coastal waters. But no, so that's a terrible problem. And there's a wonderful documentary called Sonic Sea, which I highly recommend. Just Google it and you'll, you'll find it. That, that talks about the, the sonic disruptions of whale lives through what the, the oil companies don't just do drilling, but before they do the drilling, they have to chart the ocean floor. And what they do is send air bombs down to the ocean floor to see how deep it is here and there. And that's the huge noise everywhere. And whales don't have very keen smell or sight. They, they navigate the world by hearing and they get totally flummoxed by these air bombs. So, so yeah, I mean, there are many, many things making Hal's life a misery, unfortunately. Thank you for that. I think we have another question. Hi, Professor. Um, is, this, is this okay? It's a little bit, I'm a little short. Um, is both the silver one? Okay, okay, sorry. Hi, Professor Nussbaum, can you hear me? No? Okay, um, thank you for your presentation and um, thank you for, for your thinking. I'm, I'm a, a long admirer of your work. Um, so from your uh, presentation, um, what I took from the capabilities approach is that it would require us to make a concerted effort to be in relation to other animals in order to listen to them, like to begin to understand what those particulars of capability are. And it seems to me that if we were to um, embark on this in good faith, it would truly be uh, already an unprecedented and thrilling human project um, like we've never seen before for us to actually decide to listen to what other animals have to tell us uh, about um, how they can flourish. The, the thing is, it seems to me that even with the best of intentions, um, our history of our efforts to you know learn about animals is very fraught ethically um, you know I'm thinking about early experimentation like anim like mm -hmm. ethology or, or even you know trying to um, test you know animals for for uh, like how like the so like us approach like trying to figure out their level of intelligence that these, kind of projects all have ethical problems. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the opportunities that you, you know, can think of or, or ideas about, you know, what are the contexts in which we can actually have these relations with other animals that is not so saturated in domination I, I, as a city dweller, you know, uh, um, I don't, you know, there, aside from my, my dog, 
I, I don't see many opportunities for us to truly engage with animals in this way that is not so um, yeah, saturated by domination. And so I'm just thinking like sanctuaries possibly, but not all sanctuaries, maybe just some, uh, certainly not zoos. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if you had any yeah. kind of <coughs> No, I, I think we're living in a wonderful age where these problems can be to a great extent overcome. Now, of course, uh, those of us who travel in a privileged way can go on safaris, like the eco safaris and see, interact with lots of animals, but that's not possible for most people. Whale watching, however, is pretty much within the realm of possibility for average people who live on the East Coast or the West Coast or can go there. But the main thing I think is to, well, and let me just say about zoos, I'm <clears throat> totally against zoos for large mammals. I'm not totally against them if there's a way that the, a group of sufficient size can be assembled so that the animals can live a characteristic form of social life. And then people can just, as in San Diego Zoo, watch them from above. Uh, Franz de Val describes an island which he uses for research where the apes you know, live. And, and what he's doing there is to study their social organization. So of course they have to be able to live a full life. So, so there are possibilities with monkeys and apes. And then I think for other smaller animals, there are multiple possibilities as well like for fish. So certainly no whales, no elephants, no orcas. But then with each species, we have to think, is there a way that an enclosed area could be suitable for its whole form of life? So just, just in the, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with living with a dog. And this is something that I agree with Donaldson and Kimlicka on 100%. That there's nothing <clears throat> wrong so long as the dog is able to live the life that it wants to live. And that might be true <clears throat> in a certain type of zoo. So anyway, um, there are lots of types of zoos. For example, in New Zealand, I visited this wonderful place where it's mainly to, it's, it's there for birds basically, because in New Zealand, as you may know, has no large mammals. It just doesn't have them. And so the only mammals are, are small and the predators of the birds are mainly cats and rabbits. So they've fixed up an enclosure where no one can come in, no animal can come in that's that size. They show you the size you have to be to get in. You have to be smaller than a, a little cat. And then the birds are free at the top. They can fly out and mm -hmm. they can fly in. But otherwise they're just roaming around this great large enclosure, which is full of delicious plants and people, are allowed under suitably controlled conditions, namely not having any dogs or cats with them and so forth, they can come in and observe the birds. So, so anyway, that's another thing that I think is quite reasonable. Um, but the main thing I wanna talk about is film and video. I mean, some films are not good. I actually am very critical of my octopus teacher, although it has amazing photography. And that of course is a great boon. But I think the man was focused on his own midlife crisis. It was a rather narcissistic exercise of relationship where he it was all about him and his needs and not nearly as good as what Peter Godfrey Smith does through his books where he describes his, his experiences with octopi or octopuses underwater. So anyway, um, videos that are good. And there are lots of wonderful films that really show what the animals are doing and increasingly, children can be shown these at a very early age. I don't think there's anything wrong with imaginative fairy tales where children are imagining the lives of animals in ways that are not fully accurate because it, it sensitizes them to the very fact that animals have feelings. I'm sure we all learned about animal pain and suffering through reading books about horses and elephants and dogs that were not accurate but they still, they were accurate enough that they showed that the animal was a, a, a person that had a point of view on the world. I think even the Babar books with all their tremendous flaws are an exercise in French colonialism and so on. They're wonderful. And, and they really did awaken me to the wonder of, of elephants. So, so I think those are okay and I don't wanna get rid of them, but I think what we 
can have now is films that are accurate, that bring the child into the world of nature, show them what's really going on. So then they don't have to be taken to these awful theme parks where dolphins are playing tricks and jumping through hoops. They can watch real dolphins and that would be much better. So I, <clears throat> I think now they're just manifold possibilities and teachers, I hope, are taking advantage of them and teaching kids. Thank you. One more question from, uh, and don't forget to introduce yourself. Hi, Professor Nussbaum. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, my name is Matthew Liebman. I'm the chair of the Justice for Animals program at the University of San Francisco School of Law. Um, I teach your Beyond Compassion and Humanity in uh, my Animals and Justice seminar is kind of one of the structuring pieces of how we think about justice. So it's, it's, I'm really grateful for your contributions. Um, my question has to do with how we resolve competing uh, claims to entitlement to flourish if the capabilities approach supplies uh, a way of resolving those comp competing uh, claims of entitlement. I think perhaps one of the virtues of a uh, deontological approach is that some rights might just be inviolable. One of the virtues of a utilitarian approach is you just do the math problem and the one with the most utility is the one you do. Is there a way of resolving conflicts e either between humans and, and non-humans or between non-human communities uh, in their entitlement to flourish where those- Oh yeah, are? I mean, this is of course a huge problem. I think, I think it's actually, actually a defect of utilitarianism that it makes the problem disappear. And well, we could argue that whether it's a virtue of the Kantian approach that it tells you that both sides are so inviolable that you can't move forward at all. Um, I have a whole chapter on tragic dilemmas. Uh, you might, no, no surprise, I think Greek tragedy can help us think about these. That when you reach a collision of right with right, where the idea is, as Agamemnon says, which of these is without evils? Well, the first thing is to recognize that, to recognize that we've landed ourselves in a situation where through our own heedlessness, usually, not through fate or God, we are in a position where any course we take is doing wrong to some creature. So to recognize that is the first step in going beyond that. But then I think Hegel's approach to tragedy is actually a good guide. So Hegel, in writing about the Antigone, said when you see this collision of right with right, what you need to do is imagine a world in which that collision would be aufgehoben, would be removed by your creative thinking. So for example, in the case of the Antigone, when you see that religious family rights were in violation of state mandates, you think of, he, his idea was the liberal state, which accommodates religion and, and so forth. But in the case, so, so the cases I take up there are animal experimentation, the collision of cultural rights of indigenous peoples with animal flourishing, and then collision of human and animal habitats. And I won't go through them all here, but I'll just do the first one just to give you the idea. I think there, the Hegelian solution to the terrible dilemmas and problems involved in animal experimentation. And I think they're real because experimentation using animals provides great insight into both animal well-being and human well-being. So we don't want to stop it completely. Number one, we want to mitigate the harm. And I think the new approach by Beecham and de Grazia does a lot of good work there. And I talk about that. But in the end, we have to look further into the future and be creative and think, how would we do experimentation without using animals? And the answer is computer simulation. And we just need to think about it and do it and practice it and do it because animal experimentation is not without its flaws. A lot of people think it actually misleads us in many respects. So I think it's not all that good. It's not like we have to hold on to it. We have to think of something better. And computer simulation is already used in many, many forms of surgery where the, you know, the surgeon is guided by a, a model on the computer. So I think we just, that would be the Hegelian world that we should shoot for. And in the meantime, while we're moving toward it, mitigate the harm as much as possible. Great, and, and just to follow up on um, you know, the idea of science without animals, we have a session about that coming up this weekend. So check out Dr. Charu Chandasekara and her work oh. through the Center for Alternatives yes. to Animal Methods. Uh, another question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sharon. I'm a student at the University of Guelph. 
Okay. So speak louder. This one. My name is Sharon. I'm a student at the University of Guelph. Ah. So there are people who refuse to acknowledge the rights of animals to flourish until they can prove sentience. But the only way they will accept this sentience is through animal testing, as in allowing or causing animals to feel pain and then observe them. So how can we advocate for the rights of animals and discuss their needs and sentience if some people refuse to acknowledge and accept the rights of animals until they are violated? Well, I think actually it's not that terrible a problem. Uh, the best, uh, of course, most, in the case of most animals now, there's no controversy. But in the case of fish, there's a genuine controversy. And I think there, Victoria Braithwaite's wonderful book, Do Fish Feel Pain, summarizes all this research. The research has been done in a way that I think is ethically acceptable. That is, there's a mild discomfort caused by vinegar or acetic acid, but it's, you know, it's enough to cause discomfort, but it's not enough to be ethically unacceptable, uh, I, I believe. So anyway, she really shows how they establish that fish feel pain. And it's not, the, the results can't be replicated by thinking, oh, it's just an automatic response. So anyway, it's a long story and I won't go into it here. But I think that's an example. And then of course, I guess at one point people didn't think that birds felt pain because they don't have a neocortex. But that was thoroughly exploded by better evolutionary science because what scientists realized is evolution doesn't work in just one way, leading to the neocortex as the repository of sentience. But actually birds got to the same functional result by a different path. And, and so that work on what the neuroanatomy of birds actually is like and why even without a neocortex, they, they are sentient, that, that is wonderful work too. And I don't think it involves any ethical flaws. So, I, you know, I think if we were in the era where large numbers of people just put, put, stamped their feet and said, oh, I don't even believe that a dog feels pain, then it, it would be difficult, true. And I, there are some people who object to Braithwaite and just stamp their feet and they say, oh, well, I think that can't possibly be and so But actually, I don't think there are very many such scientists and the ones who write articles of that sort are not, <laughs> they're not published in good journals. So I guess they're not doing very good science. And um, I think the world is moving on and I think we're not Cartesians thinking animals are automata. <clears throat> so what we're worried about is the borderline cases. And this is something that Michael Tai has written wonderfully about in his book of the intense bees and shell-shocked crabs. So the bees and the crabs, I mean, these are genuinely hard cases. And there, it's just a question of what, I mean, again, the, the effect is caused by, I think, ethically reasonable disruptions, like things like acid and so forth, but not, not killing them and not causing the major functional trauma but it's still, the results are very unclear. So I think there are gray areas, but really the wonderful work on fish is absolutely, and I think decisively shown by experiments that are ethically acceptable that fish really do feel pain. And that's a huge step. Thank you. So we're just about time at time. So I think unless there's anyone else with a burning question, we'll wrap things up and thank uh, Martha Nussbaum for a very enlightening talk. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. It was a great honor to be asked to be here. And um, well, my book will be out at the end of the year. I'm sorry you can't see the audience, but there's a lot of enthusiasm. So we're very grateful that you were able to join us. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you, Camille. And thank you all. Have a wonderful conference. Bye. Bye.